Welcome. Uh, can I ask you to introduce yourself and to uh, provide your testimony, please? Hi, my name is Burcu Kılıç. I'm the Legal and Policy Director for Public Citizens Global Access to Medicines Program. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify here today on behalf of Public Citizen and its 400,000 members and supporters. Public Citizen is a national nonprofit consumer advocacy organization with a 40 plus year history representing consumer interests in, con in Congress, the executive branch, and the courts. We submitted our written comments for this review earlier this month. My testimony will draw, up, uh, draw upon those comments and our experiences working, in the, um, working on the ground with government agencies, civil society organizations, academics, and patient groups. I will follow the same methodology as our written comments. I will highlight some uh, countries' laws and practices and our own observations working in and with those countries. But before that, I would like to address specific practices that can and should be improved. We suggest the following principles to support this modest reform. The special 301 report should omit any reference, whether expressed or implied, to any country's TRIPS compliant or FDA compliant policies that advance a public interest. The special 301 report should only address intellectual property, not ancillary public policies, such as pharmaceutical reimbursement, pricing, or pr procurement. The special 301 report shouldn't list countries for not adopting US policy preferences if those countries have no bilateral or international obligation to adopt the same. We distinguish between TRIPS and FDA standards, and we want you to do the same. We observe that some countries are criticized for not adopting measures such as data exclusivity or patent linkage, even if that country doesn't have an agreement with the United States expressly and specifically requiring the same. <laughs> Criticism in the Special 301 report should be accompanied by express and clearly articulated criteria. Applying these principles to our analysis, I would like to share our observations and comments about several countries. I'm going to start with Turkey, the first country I called home. I believe I have a national obligation to clarify some of the confusion about Turkey's data exclusivity system. As mentioned previously, the Special 301 report should not list countries for not adopting FDA measures such as data exclusivity unless they have an agreement with the United States expressly and specifically requiring the same. Turkey provides six years of data exclusivity for pharmaceutical products, including biologics. However, Turkey is not part of any regional or bilateral US tr treaty requiring data exclusivity over clinical trial data. Thus, Turkey's obligations for the protection of data are limited to baseline compliance with the imprecise but minimum standards set forth in the TRIPS agreement and EU-Turkey Customs Union agreement. The Special 301 report shouldn't cite Turkey for its TRIPS compliant, indeed TRIPS plus, interpretation of protection of the undisclosed test data. In recent reports, Canada has been fiercely criticized for the heightened utility requirement for patents. The North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, in parallel with TRIPS, requires that patents be granted when standards of patentability, novelty, inventive step, and industrial applicability are satisfied. NAFTA doesn't specify how these criteria should be defined and applied. NAFTA and TRIPS parties have sovereign rights not only to adopt varying patentability standards, but to change and reinterpret them. Canada requires utility, be, utility to be demonstrated or soundly predicted at the time of application. The patent system is not designed to grant monopolies on the basis of hunches, guesses, or hopes. It's also not designed to allow actual verification of the alleged invention after the fact. The data obtained and submitted to patent office after filing cannot cure the application's defect. The special 301 report shouldn't cite Canada for its TRIPS and NAFTA compliant interpretation of utility standards. Indonesia. On September 2012, the Indonesian president signed a decree authorizing government use of patents for seven HIV AIDS and hepatitis B medicines. Indo Indonesia has considerably more involved process than any procedure required by TRIPS. The procedure on government licenses includes the president of the country, the Minister of Health, 
the Minister of Justice, the Director General of Intellectual Property Rights. When Indonesia issued compulsory licenses, the internal consultations be between those ministries and the President took more than a year. Indonesia's government use licenses fully comply with TRIPS and national rules. The Special 301 report shouldn't cite Indonesia for its TRIPS compliant government use practices. And India. We observe that there is some confusion about the patent eligible subject matter, which defines what qualifies as an invention and patentability requirements. If the subject, mm, subject of the patent monopoly is not something that is pat patent eligible subject matter, there is no possibility of a patent being granted, even if the subject matter claimed is new, involves an inventive step, and it's industrially applicable. Article 27, one of TRIPS establish, establishes minimal criteria for patentability, but leaves countries flexibility to define the threshold level for patent eligible inventions. Section 3D is structured as a subject matter eligibility threshold, not as a patentability test. A true examination of Section 3D should consider all the principles clarified in the Supreme Court of India's ruling in this case. The decision of the court extended over more than 90 pages and 195 paragraphs. The paragraph quoted by USTR in recent special 301 reports must be considered in its full context if it is to provide any informative value for analysis of Section 3D. India's Section 3D complies with the TRIPS agreement. The, the Special 301 report shouldn't cite India for its TRIPS compliant interpretation of patent eligible subject matter. Past Special 301 reports have criticized India's issuing of compulsory license for a cancer medicine. This compulsory license fully complies with the India's patent law, which is narrower than what is allowed under TRIPS. The Special 301 should not cite India for, trips comply, for its TRIPS compliant compulsory licensing practices. In the interest of time, I conclude my comments here, but I encourage you to read our written submission, which also, which also addresses Chile, Peru, and Vietnam. Thank you very much. Thanks, Borju. If we can have uh, the Health and Human Services folks for first question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned in both your testimony and your written submission that uh, public citizen believes that the special 301 report should only focus on intellectual property issues and not on, quote, ancillary public policies. Um, as you know, that we are statutorily obligated to identify countries that deny, quote, deny fair and equitable market access to United States persons that rely upon intellectual property protection. So the question is, do you believe that these ancillary public policies, for example, pharmaceutical pricing and reimbursement policies, uh, do not fit within that component of the statute? And if not, what types of policies do you think that component should cover? Um, I think um, the, those ancillary pr uh, policies, public policies, pharmaceutical pricing uh, or reimbursement policies, they, are not, they shouldn't be considered as intellectual property issues, and that's we don't consider as intellectual property Can issues. Can I just clarify real quick? So actually, uh -huh. um, we're distinguishing between the intellectual property uh -huh. issues and the market access uh, for persons that rely upon intellectual property protection. Mm -hmm. So just wanna, so okay. that's the distinction I'm asking okay. about. Yeah. Okay, but there is there is no discrimination against the, the uh, against the industries like the pharmaceutical industry in those countries for uh, um, when when the co countries have pharmaceutical pricing or reimbursement regimes, and as Jamie under explained d during his testimony, I think we have a problem with the, the cost of the medicines, and every country has a different way to deal with this problem, and. I know that the USTR has started to include certain provisions in its uh, recent free trade agreements on these issues, but still, even the, the TPP agreement does not uh, does not provide a clear like a pro a clear a framework for the pharmaceutical reimbursement or or pricing policies. Thanks. Uh, our next question will come from the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. 
Another theme in your testimony as well in, as your written submission on page 12 regarding India is how countries should be given the flexibility to determine patentability standards. Are there any situations that you believe in which a new form, a new formulation, or perhaps even a new structure can be given patent protection? Or alternatively, do you believe that it would be the policy that all such innovations should be barred in all situations? Thank you. Yeah, the Indian uh, Section 3D is, uh, is, is formulated as the certain inventions. Uh, it's an, uh, the inventions, oh no, not the inventions, the subject matter, let's say, let's call it a subject matter, because it's, it's uh, before we start, uh, whether the invention, uh, whether uh, the invention is patentable, we have to, to determine whether the subject matter is, is an invention. And Indian uh, Section 3D is, is formulated as, as a test to determine whether the subject matter is an invention or not. And the subject matter, if it is an e-views, if it satisfies the, the requirement, if it is a, if a, if a, the requirement that, that, is, that is set in the uh, section 3D, it qualifies as an invention, and then it, it, it passes the test, and then it's, it's subject to patentability requirements, and the patent office checks whether it, uh, it is patentable or not. And in most of the cases, this is the problem we've been having with uh, most of this uh, uh, so-called inventions, the, the, those patents are the secondary patents. There, there is already a one patent existing on those patents, and that's the same problem with Canada's utility uh, test because the, the the pharmaceutical companies they they run to the patent office and they want to get uh, another patent on the new views or 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 the new formulation, but m most of the time those those patent applications either fail the the test of invention. Or, or the utility requirement, as in, as in the case of Canada. Thanks very much for your testimony and for appearing today. Uh, if I can invite the trademark working group to please uh, approach. Welcome, sir. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and uh, begin your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul Kilmer, I'm the founder of the Trademark Working Group and uh, an alumni of American University's Washington College of Law, which seems to be some sort of criteria uh, <laughs> for, for being up here this morning. There, there we are, so off to a good start. Uh, the Trademark Working Group, uh, again, appreciates the opportunity uh, to present uh, hearing testimony. Uh, in relation to practices that do not uh, provide adequate and effective protection to trademark rights. Now, we have provided you with our copy of our Global Trademark Report Card, which has been updated for this year. It highlights uh, laws and practices of foreign nations that uh, we think are important for you to assess and use as you go into discussions with uh, representatives of foreign nations. I will therefore only highlight a few matters uh, for the record. Uh, again, this year, uh, China has formed the bulk of our comments in relation to uh, issues encountered by U.S. trademark owners. Uh, these include especially the elimination of direct appeals from the China Trademark Office to the Trademark Review and Adjudication Board by unsuccessful opposers, most of which are foreign companies. That situation is now exacerbated by CTMO opposition examiners who have become increasingly unpredictable and narrowly focused on whether the respective goods and services of the parties are in the same subclasses and whether the marks are virtually identical. They therefore tend to overlook broader issues in assessing the likelihood of confusion between marks. The Chinese trademark system also suffers from unnecessary notarization and legalization formalities required to file applications, to bring oppositions, and to support TRAB actions. It also suffers from inflexibility in relation to descriptions of goods and services that does not take into account new technologies in many cases. The Chinese system also tends to disregard affidavits and witness declarations in the inter partes proceedings, even regarding uncontested facts. And it continues to have unreasonably high standards for establishing well-known mark 
status. This is all in addition to a continued glaring lack of transparency in all phases of trademark prosecution, opposition, cancellation, and invalidation practice. The slows. In our 2015 submission, we called attention to nations such as India and Brazil, which have failed to adjudicate opposition and cancellation proceedings within a reasonable period of time. Unfortunately, the formulation of various action plans and similar efforts have failed to alleviate the backlog of long pending oppositions in these nations, some of which date back nine years or more. In fact, I was working on one just this morning from India that is 11 years old. Multi-class applications. This year's global trademark report card notes more than 30 nations that still require single-class trademark applications. This requirement leads to additional cost, both in terms of initial filings and in relation to docketing and maintenance of multiple registrations. Single-class applications are still required in nations such as Argentina, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates. Certification marks. Despite USTR highlighting this issue in its 2014 and 2015 Special 301 reports, many nations ranging from Afghanistan to Yemen still do not protect certification marks. Standards for approving certification marks in other nations vary to such a degree and in often impose unique requirements on the certification process such that owners of many certification marks cannot maintain consistent standards and regimes around the globe, thereby undercutting the entire certification process. Formalities and recordations. Like China, there are a number of nations that continue to require a host of formalities that are overly burdensome on trademark owners. For example, Argentina, Egypt, Kuwait, Panama, the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates all maintain legalization requirements. Similarly, a number of nations continue to require recordation of license agreements in order to ensure the validity of those contracts within the nation. Such requirements are unduly burdensome and set a trap for the unwary. Oppositions. The absence of effective opposition proceedings allow trademark pirates to obtain presumptive rights in marks in nations such as Russia and Belarus. Similarly, the Ukraine, which has opposition proceedings in name only, generally requires trademark owners of misappropriated marks to seek their remedy in court. Stealth Paris Convention applications. We have noted this issue in previous years, and there remain a number of nations in which newly filed applications cannot be effectively located during the six-month priority period. These include China, Egypt, Indonesia, and the United Arab Emirates, among many others. Other practices highlighted in our report that I will just briefly mention, a number of nations continue to give little or no weight to consents to registration. This includes Brazil, China, Japan, and Thailand. Others have not joined the Madrid Protocol. These include Argentina, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, and the UAE. Others, such as the Bahamas and Zambia, do not have service mark registrations. All of these practices and others noted in our global trademark report card continue to pose obstacles to adequate and effective protection of trademark rights abroad. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for your statement. Uh, if we can go to the Department of Commerce for the first. Thank you. You had mentioned a couple of countries that are slow to implement uh, opposition procedures and others uh, where uh, they, they simply uh, are not present. And I'm hoping you can drill down a little bit on the policy behind that. How do opposition procedures benefit the administration of a trademark <coughs> system and how do specifically do they help uh, U.S. companies in the market? Right. Uh, in, in some cases, the delays may uh, at least initially assist U.S. companies if they happen to be the, the, the one bringing the opposition proceeding. Uh, in those countries that have very slow opposition processes, uh, obviously if, if the applicant has to wait uh, 11 or 13 years to get a registration uh, and the opposer is a foreign company, that may benefit you in, in the short haul. 
unfortunately, more and more uh, American companies are the applicants. And uh, they are waiting uh, 11, 10, 12, 13, 14 years uh, for an opposition decision and, uh, in most cases, uh, getting a registration and the statutory and presumptive rights that uh, flow from those registrations. In countries such as Russia and Belarus that do not have opposition proceedings at all, uh, they allow pirates to register marks uh, really without effective ex parte examination procedures, uh, in which case those registrations by the trademark pirates are allowed all of the statutory presumptions until such time as they can be canceled, mostly through court action, which tends to be far more expensive than the administrative procedures available through trademark offices. So I, I think those in, in brief would be the points. Great. And if I can turn to the U.S. Patent Trademark Office for the second question. Thank you. The survey you've provided in your global trademark report card is quite thorough. Are there any regional trends and trademarks that emerged as you put together your submission? And separately, do you know of any research or do you have any quantitative data on how these hurdles raise the costs or prolong delays of trademark registration? Uh, we actually do not collect data. Uh, we're, we're not uh, in that business, unfortunately. The, the Trademark Working Group is a volunteer group that uh, gets input from uh, its participants in some foreign council and, and really doesn't do quantitative research. We, we leave that to others uh, at American University and elsewhere. But uh, in, in terms of regional trends, uh, one thing that we have started to look at, and this is not highlighted in this year's report, uh, is relative grounds examination. Uh, more and more of uh, <coughs> our members and, and others that we, we speak with are concerned about countries and regional groups that have abandoned uh, their relative examination processes, such as the United Kingdom and the Community Trademark Office. Uh, and this seems to be allowing a lot of deadwood to get on the register, and we're very concerned about that trend. Thanks very much, Mr. Comer. Um, if I can next invite the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's uh, Global Intellectual Property Center. Welcome, and if you can introduce yourself uh, for the record and begin your testimony. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Kilbride. I'm the Executive Director for International IP at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Global Intellectual Property Center. I have no affiliation with American University. Uh, however, the single best star I ever made was a graduate of the program, so I am grateful to the institution. Um, I wanted to, to comment on two things for you today uh, as, as a subset of our broader testimony, which, number one, um, to share with you some of the uh, global findings of the U.S. Chamber's International IP Index, which I think provide important context for the, um, for the process here. And second, to comment on a few country-specific uh, developments that I think are um, sort of highlight the, the importance of this effort, and those countries are uh, India, China, and Canada. So first, um, in terms of context, uh, one of the earlier witnesses uh, said that global IP norms are low and under-enforced. And I think uh, the U.S. Chamber's International IP Index shows that, in fact, that is the case. Uh, there, uh, we looked at 38 countries in 2012 across a broad range of uh, geographies, uh, market size, levels of development. And uh, it showed that every single country has a different IP profile. Uh, some are stronger in patents and weaker in copyrights. Uh, many have uh, relatively decent trademark laws, but the enforcement is lagging. Um, application and, and ratification of uh, international treaties, especially the most cutting-edge treaties that sort of set the, uh, the norms in the multilateral <coughs> space, are uneven. Um, so what we find is that uh, intellectual property is not a yes or no policy choice. Countries are really at every point on the spectrum. And uh, the point that we tried to make in our 301 submission that we make when we talk to foreign governments is that it's not necessary for us to criticize your policy choices, but it is our, our right and responsibility on behalf of the business community to point out what we believe those choices represent and what the outcomes 
and, and the views of the business community are. So, uh, for instance, um, you know, we look at uh, issues that have been raised today, such as uh, broadening exceptions to laws that in many countries aren't even yet in place. And we, uh, you know, we, we would look at that suggestion with concern. Um, I think uh, one of the things that has made the U.S. system especially strong and uh, you know, would apply this characterization to some of the other most uh, innovative countries in the world is the, f the way that our system instills legal certainty in the marketplace. Because at its best, intellectual property works uh, to provide inventors to creators with an asset that can hold value that they can use to leverage financing to be able to bring an innovative product or service to market. And where that system breaks down, where there's less legal certainty, we've seen that the innovative output has faltered. And I'll, I'll draw a, a distinction here, and I don't want to pick on India, but because it's been so central to the conversation, I'll say, you know, in our conversations with the Indian government, we have been consistent in saying that the single biggest thing they can do is to find ways to instill uh, legal certainty in the marketplace. And Compulsory licensing is, is frequently discussed as you know, one of the challenges in the Indian marketplace and the rejoinder is naturally, well, there's only been one, uh, and that's true. But certainly under the previous administration, uh, the Indian government actively fostered an environment where every company in that space felt like they could be next. Uh, and in that sort of environment, investors aren't going to uh, and put their capital in place, certainly not fixed capital, they're not going to invest in research and development, they're not going to hire the, the personnel who present the, you know, the human knowledge capital. So, uh, you know, with some of India's principal goals uh, of uh, making India, digital India, startup India, we believe they're being held back by uh, an IP system that doesn't provide that mechanism that lets inventors take their ideas and turn them into uh, commercial products. Contrast that with, with the United States, which by no means uh, we believe to be a perfect system, but the fact is that in the United States, if, you're a, if you are an inventor, you hold a patent, you have a, a reasonable presumption that your rights are, are enforceable, that you, and you may lose a particular court case, you may, uh, an administrative ruling may not go your way, but by and large, you have confidence in the system that IP rights are enforceable under law, and anything that uh, sort of creates, makes exceptions the rule rather than uh, intellectual property rights the rule is going to create uh, a circumstance that weakens that legal certainty in our own market. Um, with India, you know, we were very hopeful that uh, with the new administration, uh, we were seeing steps in the right direction. And, you know, several of them mentioned here today, the establishment of specialized IP courts was an important development. There was a, a, a more recent development. On February 19th, uh, the government issued uh, a revised set of guidelines on the patentability of computer-related inventions. And it, to do that, it reopened uh, a, pro a consultation process that had been closed in the fall. Final guidelines had <coughs> been issued, and the new guidelines reissued on February 19th went 180 degrees in the wrong direction. That raises for us not only a, a challenge with the, with the policy outcome, which we believe is not in India's best interest, but uh, a question of due process. And it's this type of challenge that sort of seems to have cropped up continually uh, in that relationship. With respect to China, you know, we, we see s similar challenges in many respects, but at the same time, uh, an incremental uh, sense of improvement, uh, including in uh, China's score on the GIBC index. Um, and the difference is, I think, that uh, the government of China seems to have made a policy decision that it needs a stronger IP system to facilitate its own innovative industries and to, to nurture those industries. We agree 100 percent. In Canada, the issue with a, you know, probably the, the lowest ranking developed country on our, on our index, the problem, as has been mentioned previously, is patent utility. Again, by Weakening the, uh, the certainty in the marketplace, this creates all sorts of questions about whether uh, a, a patent can really be uh, an asset and hold value. And so we believe it undermines both Canada's interest and our own. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Mr. Kilbride. Uh, uh, for our first question, I'd like to go to the U.S. Copyright Office, please. Um, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, one of the themes that was in your uh, submission. Um, the center has listed camcording as a concern in many countries, including Brazil, Chile, China, Mexico, Peru, Russia, Thailand, and Venezuela. What have you and your members found to be the most effective tactic for dealing with camcording? Is it, for example, the case where a new law has to be passed? And if so, what key elements might you find in that law? Thank you. Uh, thank you. You know, like, like most uh, matters of law, I think a deterrent effect is the s sim simplest and, and most straightforward thing that countries can do. You know, criminal or civil liabilities need to be strong enough to provide a deterrent. And then, you know, it's important that uh, prosecutors have the flexibility to respond to realities. You know, uh, in the TPP negotiations, I believe uh, some countries raised objections based on the idea that teenagers could be prosecuted for getting their cell phones out. Nobody wants to see that happen. Um, but if you have a strong law regulation in place, then and with the <coughs> appropriate flexibility, governments can do the right thing. Thanks. U.S. Department of Agriculture for a second question. Thank you, Mr. Kilbride, for appearing here today. Uh, in the GIPC International IP Index, there are challenges to trademark holders caused by overly expansive protection for geographical indications, lack of transparency, and due process for trademark holders. Is that a part of trademark indicators? Uh, so I, I think transparency and due process are critical to intellectual property uh, systems across the board. So whether it's the patent space, copyright space, or trademark, uh, having access to rules that set the process in advance are, are absolutely indispensable. And so that's why they're reflected in our index. Um, in terms of uh, you know geographical <coughs> indications, uh, the, the index doesn't speak quite as directly to that issue, um, but we've watched with, you know, some concern developments in the World Intellectual Property Organization with the Madrid Protocol and um, <coughs> have worked with our counterparts overseas to help uh, ensure that U.S. interests aren't unduly uh, prejudiced in by those developments. Thank you. One final follow-up from the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, thank you. In your written testimony um, and comments, you had mentioned, the center had mentioned that industry groups had previously been opposed to the safe harbors proposed in the Australian exposure draft, uh, the copyright amendment, this is the one on disability access and other measures bill. Would you be more specific and identify what are your priority concerns about these safe harbors and also what actions should be taken in a bill that would address your concerns? Uh, if I may, I'd like to get back to you with more detail on that. But I mean, the, the basic premise is that we don't want to see the types of broad uh, exceptions or limitations to IP rules that make the exception the rule rather than the, the right the rule. So, for instance, if we, we get to a, a circumstance where uh, IP rights are considered discretionary provision or provisional, then that really defeats the, the purpose of having a system that provides legal certainty allows, uh, you know, that value-based enforceable asset mechanism to work. Thanks very much, Mr. Kilbride. Um, if I could now invite the U.S. India Business Council, please approach. Welcome, sir. If you can introduce yourself and uh, please begin your testimony.
changes, thank you, changes in the Cinematograph Act to prevent illegal camcording, both government will be conducting joint exercise on copyrights in April 2016 and trade secrets in June, July 2016. Number two, improve transparency and frequent dialogue with the industry. USIBC member believe the government of India has been open and collaborative with industry over the past year, often meeting with the industry to discuss IPR issues and approaching discussions with a willingness to solve problems quickly. USIBC also recently held a joint training program with the Indian Patent Office and Government of India and has expressed interest in doing more training and capacity building with the industry. Judicial alignment. Judicial precedent on IPR this past year has been greatly improved. <coughs> Courts in India have upheld decisions that have improved IPR, including in the pharmaceutical sector and in trademarks for our member, John Deere. Also, the passage of the Commercial Courts, Commercial Division, and Commercial Appellate Division of High Court Bill in December 2015, which will allow for the creation of specialized commercial benches within the High Courts to more efficiently educate commercial disputes, including IPR, was another positive development. US IBC member Boeing also reinforced this concept by stating in their 301 written submission that India has a legal framework that is adequate to protect IP with no known cases of IP violation involving Boeing's activities in the defense and aerospace sector. Denial of compulsory licenses. The government of India has denied compulsory license applications, providing companies with certainty and predictability that will patent will be upheld in India. No compulsory license have been issued by the government since 2013. The Ministry of Commerce within the government of India has assured industry that it will be final decision-making authority on the issue of compulsory licenses in the country. The government of India has indicated to USIBC that the new IPR policy will not advocate for forced uh, technology transfer in green technology. Capacity building, the Indian Patent Office now continues to modernize and commit additional resources for patent examination, including quadrupling the number of patent examiners and integration of patent databases with global repositories. We see this as a good development. Messaging at the top, Prime Minister Modi has been very vocal on the need for building a strong and robust intellectual property regime in the country. New initiative launched by the Prime Minister, such as the Startup India Initiative, recognizes that the intellectual property are emerging as a strategic business tool for any business organization to enhance industrial competitiveness. Initiative and statements like this demonstrate a change in tone and recognition of value of IPR uh, to India. As outlined above, significant positive improvements in IPR have been made in the past year. Now I want to highlight a few recommendations on which USIBC is currently in dialogue with the government of India. Number one, we recommend that the government of India consult with the industry on the guidelines for the examination of patent application for computer-related inventions. They have given us a firm assurance that steps will be undertaken to resolve an industry issues at the earliest. Two, we recommend that responsibility for the enforcement of the Copyright Act of 1957 and related in international convention be consolidated and shifted to the one department, like the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. Three, we recommend issuing regulations or guidelines that will specifically interpret Section 3D, thereby providing clarity to companies on when and, and their patent will be protected. Four, as a near-term step towards resolving the challenge of lack of patent linkage system in India, USIBC has suggested that a mechanism be put in place that will ensure that all information related to application for manufacturing and marketing approvals be made available in the public domain for a predefined period of time before any action should be taken on the application. USIBC applauds the government of India for taking concrete steps in the last 12 months to protect intellectual properties of US companies in India. 
The Modi government has been very proactive in building a strong IP regime in the country evident, uh, it's evident from several policy interventions and strong commitment shown by the government to work closely with the industry to identify and resolve issues. USIBC believes that positive reinforcement by this committee will further enable the government of India to build on concrete steps taken. In closing, the US-India partnership is of great importance and promise. Therefore, it is vitally important that we engage with India as equals in a manner which enables them to implement an IP regime that is at par with global standards. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Aghi. Uh, for our first question, if we can go to the Department of Treasury, please. Thanks very much for your submission. Um, my question is the same that we posed to uh, AFTI earlier. Um, how will Prime Minister Modi's Made in India policy intersect with India's intellectual property regime? Um, without stronger IP protections, companies both domestic and international are wary of investing in India. Will Made in India policy lead to intellectual property policy reforms? I believe that the Make in India is very critical for this government to be successful in creating jobs. And for that to be successful, I think a world-class IP policy has to be issued and implemented by the government of India to be successful. Thanks. Our second question, uh, I'll look to the Department of Commerce. Uh, thank you. Uh, you are the second India-focused trade organization that we've heard from uh, today, the first one uh, earlier being the Alliance for Fair Trade with India. And uh, wondering if you've had a chance to uh, review uh, their recommendations uh, and could describe how your views differ from that organization's views and to what you attribute those differences. Uh, I have not reviewed their submission, but uh, I can uh, uh, talk on behalf of member companies uh, on the commitment towards investment in India. If you look at last year, uh, US member companies invested almost $15 billion into India. And when we did a survey of our uh, of partial membership of 52 companies, they plan to invest another $27 billion in India because they see uh, India as a lucrative market. And as I testified in the case of Boeing and John Deere, they feel quite assured by the uh, IP commitment the Indian government has made. Great, thanks. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. U.S. Pat Trademark Office. In your submission, you reserve the right to amend your recommendation to suggest an upgrade or downgrade depending on the final national IPR strategy. What would the plan include that would lead you to suggest a downgrade or upgrade to what? I think we are uh, encouraging working uh, on the new uh, IP policy document, which uh, is uh, about to be released. And what we have suggested Indian government is have a little more consultative process to make sure that it meets the global standards. And for whatever reason, if it does not meet the global standards, then we will definitely recommend uh, downgrade, but all the signs are that things seems to be moving in the right direction from our U.S. Uh, business ent uh, enterprises in India itself. Great. Well, thanks very much for appearing today, Dr. Aghi. Uh, and that brings us to our next and final presenter, uh, the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment. Thank you. The good thing about being the last one is that I'm the last one. <laughs> A warm welcome to you. Uh, if you can introduce yourself for the record and please begin your testimony. Thanks. Okay, my name is Manon Ras, and I'm here to represent the Union for Affordable Cancer Treatment, UACT, which is a volunteer organization, a union of uh, people affected by cancer, their family, their friends, people who take care of them, healthcare professional, cancer researchers, all committed to increasing access to effective cancer treatment and care. We are, of course, concerned about the rapidly escalating cost of cancer mitigation in the U.S. and all over the world. 
as a cancer patient myself in active treatment since 2010, uh, and with all DOAC members who are concerned, we agree with pharma, actually, pharma's comments, <coughs> that advances in biotechnology and genomics are propelling the discovery of new medicine, I'm quoting them, to treat a range of chronic and infectious diseases. We note, as pharma did in its comments, that the American Cancer Society, in an article dated January 7, 2016, quite recently, reported that cancer death rate have been reduced nearly 23% since 1991. This is all great news. And for many patients, cancer has become a, a chronic disease that when well treated, including with new targeted therapy, like the one I receive, can be controlled and allows patients to live long, very long and useful life. However, pharma is also asking for trade policies that make these drugs more expensive and which will, of course, restrict access. So first, I would like to address some of the comments on India. Pharma wants India to be placed on the priority watch list because India used only once compulsory <coughs> licensing of patents on essential life-saving cancer drugs, and that could happen again, even though India has already faced much pressure to not issue such licensing. I would like to quote the, the pharma submission. The Indian government appears to have taken a more measured and cautious approach in responding to recent CL cases, including the denial of two CLs this year. We're encouraged by this trend. However, the grounds for issuing a CL under the provisions are broad, vague, and appear to include criteria that are not clearly related to legitimate health emergencies. The Ministry of Health continues to make recommendation to impose CL on certain <coughs> anti-cancer medicine under the special provision of Section 92 of India's Patent Act, which would make it even more difficult for patent owners to defend their patents. In support of this comment, Pharma makes reference to a compulsory license for the cancer drug desatinib, which treats leukemia. Once leukemia is resistant to uh, Gleevec, you have to take desatinib or you're dead. Um, which was proposed like other several cases involving expensive cancer drugs. It was never issued after pressure from industry and USTR. Again, we strongly object to the pharmaceutical industry misrepresentation of the WTQ rules, especially on the issue of national emergency. And if you permit me, I will quote again the WTO FAQ following the compulsory licensing statement from the website, WTO website. Does there have to be an emergency? And the response, not necessarily. This is a common misunderstanding. The TRIPS agreement <coughs> does not specifically list the reason that might be used to justify compulsory licensing. However, the Doha Declaration on TRIPS and Public Health confirmed that countries are free to determine the grounds for granting compulsory licenses. And later, for national emergencies, other circumstances of extreme urgency or public non-commercial use or government use or anti-competitive practices, there is no need to try first for a voluntary license. It's the only instance when the TRIPS agreement specifically links emergency to compulsory licensing. You act. You act. Members welcome the Indian Supreme Court rejection of the Bayer appeal of the next of our compulsory license that Firma complained about in its comment. At the heart of that case was the fact that Bayer was charging 65,000 U.S. dollars per year in India for a cancer drug and only to a small member of a number of patients that needed the drug could even be able to afford it. What is unfortunate is that India has been pressured to not issue more of these compulsory licensing. Pharma wants the USTR to ensure free reign to their greed while patients do not have any hope to have access. For us, cancer patients and people who care about cancer patients, India is particularly important because it has the potential to supply affordable generic drugs also to other countries, including the US. I myself benefited from uh, a drug that was um, out of stock in the US, but that was imported from India. High prices for cancer drugs led to, leads to a, a rationing of access around the world. For the cancer patient who are unable to have access to a drug that they need, it means a painful death. Secondly, regarding Korea, 
UAC would like to comment on the formal request to place Korea on the watch list for its independent review mechanism, RIM, under Article 535E of the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement and the side letter, Korea agreed to make available an independent review process that may be invoked at the request of an applicant directly affected by a pricing reimbursement recommendation or determination. Pharma complains that the Korean government has taken the position that reimbursed prices negotiated by the pharmaceutical industry and it should not be subject to the RM because the National Health Insurance Service does not make determination and merely negotiate the final price at which a company will be reimbursed. Pharma notes that local data indicates that from 2007 to 2012, the NHIS determined not to reimburse 59 or 20 0.3 percent of the 291 new medicine for which it was tasked to negotiate the reimbursed price. And again, according to Pharma, for anti-cancer drug, the reje rejection rate was even higher, 37.9 percent. The Korean National Service decided to reimburse only 18 of the 29 anti-cancer drug that Korea's uh, review and service agency had determined should be reimbursed. We're, we thus agree with uh, pharma that the prices of drugs are too high. In Korea, patients do not have reimbursement for a large number of cancer drugs. But why? The high prices for the drugs are restricting access. If high prices are blocking access in Korea, the government of Korea should be free to take measures legal measures to break drug monopolies so prices fall. Pharma is highlighting the negative consequences of high prices. Korea should put the monopoly at risk and not the patients. But the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement makes that more and more difficult. Finally, regarding taste data. Oh. Pharma is using the 301 process to pressure countries to provide exclusive rights to clinical trial data to further block generic or biosimilar version of drugs. Pharma critiqued 15 countries for their failure to provide exclusive right in text data, including countries like Vietnam, Egypt, and Thailand, where most people are very poor. <coughs> Pharma says data exclusivity is carefully balanced mechanism that improve access to medicine of all kinds citing the Hatch-Waxman Act, which was passed over 30 years ago under very specific circumstances in the United States and which does not provide exception to the test data monopoly. When the prices for life-saving cancer drugs are too high for any government, the best option is better price regulation or compulsory licensing of the patents. The worst option is, of course, to prevent access to life-saving drugs. But what is the impact of policy on access? We call upon the USTR to initiate a period impact assessment to report upon the specific implication of the IPR policies that it has endorsed and continues to endorse through the special 301 process and international trade agreements on patients and their families. Specifically, we ask for detailed data that would illuminate precisely how many cancer patients suffer and die or die too soon because of the lack of an affordable generic or biosimilar medicine that they could have access via compulsory license were it not for the pressure by USTR and other agencies. We can thank Pharma for providing some data on the restricted access to cancer drug in Korea, but this is not just a problem in Korea. The finding of such report would be an important addition to the factors taken into consideration by policymakers. The data for this impact assessment should include a review of historical reports of cancer incidence, mortality and years of life lost. USTR should also encourage and facilitate the future collection of this data by cancer type. <coughs> this impact assessment should also rec record the historical and future access to and cost of cancer treatment by medicines. Documentation of this data would illustrate the number of patients eligible for newer costlier cancer treatment who are forced to forego treatment due to financial burden caused by this medicine. The focus should be on R&D rather than on IPR. 
And instead of preventing access and innovation of anti-cancer drug, USTR should include in its assessment of our trading partner a role in supporting investment in R&D, including public sector or R&D through programs similar to what the NIH does. The focus on high price kills patients, and there are better options and better targets for trade policy. Focus on R&D, not just IPR. The USTR could also begin to collect data on government programs to fund medical R&D through grants, research contracts, and other methods which contribute to innovation and which do not depend, depend upon high prices of drugs. Thank you. Uh, so Ms. Rez, your time's expired, but I'd like to find some time, uh, uh, benefits of being last, I guess, for at least one question from the panel. Sure. Okay. Uh, Emily, you're free to come back. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Um, I have a question about the market access version of, the, I'm sorry, the market access section of the 301 report. As you know, we also report on market access concerns such as high tariffs on medicines, long regulatory delays, and long delays in listing new pharmaceuticals on national formularies. I just was wondering in your view if you think that these types of issues are also important in the access to medicines conversation. Thanks. Well, of course, they're very important, and they're not all equal, actually, because, and they're not all uh, linked to IPR. Uh, on the formulary question, because it's one thing where I've been involved, um, uh, the drug I'm taking is not on the formulary in the UK, for example, and therefore, you know, the, the UK is, uh, is preventing the drug I'm taking from being uh, imported there since it's not uh, made in England. So th there are all sort of issues, and it's always linked to the high prices of the drugs. And I think that uh, you should all focus on that. I think the American people all care about the prices of drugs. But on the specific uh, uh, market access of some, some drugs, I, w I would have to get back to you from the uh, UAC members. Actually, one final question, if we can, uh, yeah. to USTR. Some of the other commenters have noted in their submissions that um, the uh, prevalence of generics has risen dramatically in the United States over the past 20 years, and they attribute that at least in part to the Hatch-Waxman system. Do you disagree with that, or do you um, have any uh, response to those? Well, I, we of that? course welcome the introduction of generics. It just takes too long, usually, and it's uh, it's a pity that it takes so long. Now, a lot of the issues that cancer patients have to face uh, is that sometimes when a drug is not under patents, it's not even being manufactured. It happened to me, and uh, 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 the drug had to be imported from India because nobody wanted to manufacture here. I think that the, in general, generics are, are too long to arrive on the market, but when they arrive on the market, they should actually <coughs> be sold and not for high prices of drugs, like the brand names. But that's not your problem, that's regulation. <laughs> well, thanks very much for your Thank testimony. You. We really appreciate it, Ms. Ress. Um, and uh, that concludes today's hearing. Uh, just a final few closing remarks. Um, on behalf of the Special 301 Committee, I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your day. I know many of you uh, even who didn't testify came in to, uh, to hear the different perspectives, the many different perspectives that we heard today. Uh, and we really appreciated, uh, you know, the ability to find, um, for these perspectives to inform us, to provide more insight, more information into the 2016 Special 301 Review. We appreciate the research, the thought, the problem-solving efforts that were part of your written submissions, your oral statements, uh, and the answers to our questions today. So uh, as I noted throughout uh, today, 